out, this would be a good idea to do so now. If not, we can proceed with the presentation. I see Lisa Krasna in the back, which is with public health and what's her name? Oh, my name is Michael. Uh, you're public health? Uh, no, I'm actually on a trip with China now. Uh -huh. uh, Aha, so you did with China. I'm a Public health, sir. James from BME department. May from engineering, student affairs. So I am very, very delighted to have uh, uh, Dr. Robert Etrano here with us today. We've been having ongoing uh, discussions off and on for about a year, and, and this is uh, really a, a, a watershed in having uh, his participation in our program, um, partly because we want to reach out to those and on our campus who are actually in the field of doing public health. And he was trained as a physician and as a researcher, and his expertise is in cardiology. He has had uh, lots of publications and experience uh, in research. And a few years ago, traveled to China on invitation from a professor there, and uh, essentially fell in love with the culture, the people, the place, the public health issues that he felt he could make a difference. And he has taken students and colleagues uh, over to China to, uh, especially the rural areas, to look at uh, heart disease and today he's going to talk to us about these experiences and I hope that we can follow up with him with additional questions and, and discussion. So thank you. Thank you Professor Alicia. So I'm going to talk about the growing epidemic of hypertension and heart disease in China, and what uh, the small organization that uh, I belong to, and which Professor Wong belongs to, uh, and which some of you may know about, the China California Heart Watch, uh, is are trying to do uh, in in confronting this. And so, first of all, I would like to start this with some questions, and I want you to you don't have to tell me the answers to these questions. Perhaps you could jot them down really quickly and then think about what your answers would be. Chinese farmers, the rural population of China, what do you what percent of, is what percent of the world's population? Is it you know, five percent, ten percent? What is it? And what is presently the most important cause of death in this sector of the world's population? And how rapidly is this cause of death increasing in China, in terms of the number of deaths, in terms of mortality? How rapidly is that increasing? I mean, there's a hint there that it is increasing, but how fast is it increasing uh, compared to the United States? What source of support, in terms of healthcare support, is the most likely to solve the problem of heart disease in China? private sector, Chinese government, or what support? And how can a small organization best influence the potential source of support to do more about this? And if you try to think about these questions, you'll understand my logic in founding this small organization and working in China, uh, which is not only to directly do something and make a difference, but perhaps to influence the powers of be to make even a bigger difference. Let's start with the first question. Rural Chinese people make up one-eighth of the world's population. More than there are people in the United States. 800 million people live in rural China. Western rural China, in particular, is poor and has 
as I said, as a response to one of the questions, is in a sense getting even poorer. There's enormous inequality between rich and poor. There is breakneck urbanization with people rapidly moving from rural villages into middle-sized and large cities. And I'll show you an example of that, an amazing example of that in just a minute, of a uh, city in China that some of you have, I know have visited, but you may not know the facts about its population increase. Uh, and there is no economic base in the private sector or even in the local government that could possibly meet the health care needs of this enormous population. The, the local economies are just too poor. They could not do it on their own. They have to get help from the outside. It, this is from 2006, so it's a few years old, but it's, statistics today are pretty much are the same. There are 100 million rural Chinese that earn less than $1 income per day. That's, we talk about the poverty in the small countries like Haiti, enormously poor and unfortunate uh, population. There's 10 times as many people in China that are that poor. They're getting poorer. Between 2001 and 2006, the poorest 10% of households saw a reduction in their income from $546 to $420. There's enormous inequality, both between regions and between uh, the rich and the poor in given regions. Urbanization is depleting labor in rural areas, making it difficult for rural poor regions to attract investments. This uh, uh, table here shows the gross domestic product comparisons. It's flashing, you can give me a plus. <laughs> 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 In 2005, uh, in China, in, in, in total, the, here is, the main thing is to look at the comparisons here. If you look at the um, eastern coast of China, it's $3,528 GDP per year. And, uh, and if you look at the, we call the southern hinterland, uh, which includes Yunnan province, it's three times smaller. So this is the kind of inequality between regions that you have in productivity and income. Urbanization. Uh, this is about Dali City. Uh, who has been to this city? Dr. Wang has been there. Dali City is right in the middle of Dali State. This is Dali State or Dali Prefecture. And Dali City is right in the middle. It's in the south, southern part of Lake. Uh, this is our lake, our high. And uh, in the year 1000, it was the 14th largest city in the world. It had 90,000 people. So in the year 1000, the cities weren't very big. Dali was a big metropolis. It was a big metropolis. It was the capital of a small kingdom. And between 1000 and 1983, its population did not change. In 1983, its population was still about 90,000. It actually went down and then went back up a little to 90,000. So it reached its one year 1000 population in 1983. Since 1983, what's happened in Dali City? This is what's happened. Its population has gone from about 100,000, 90,000 to about almost 600,000. It's increased more than five times in that short period of time. So where did all those people come from? They came from the countryside. They came from the villages. They came from the small towns in the rural areas. Is this um, trend is pretty much true for most of the larger cities in Yunnan? Uh, Dali is one of the fastest growing in population, but uh, the, very, the very large city, like Kunming, is about now about six million, not five to six million. They're also increasing in size, but not, not at this rate. 
And even the very like Shanghai and Beijing are also increasing. Yes? Do you know if this is the norm for most uh, Chinese cities? Because I'm, I've been seeing that like, people go back to the countryside because of the economic downturn in 2008 through 2010. Uh, you, uh, the question is, in you know, the economic downturn, the worldwide recession, which we are now in, uh, has that caused people to go back to the countryside? Um, I think, you know, once again, I'm not an economist. I, I think what happened was the people moved from the eastern manufacturing cities, like Shenzhen and Guangzhou, Shanghai. Uh, they moved from those cities and they went back to their provinces and then they went out and got jobs in local cities like here. So I don't think these cities are decreasing in population now because of that. They're still building and developing. It's not as fast as they were in, uh, in say, 2000 or 2001, 2002, but they're still building uh, and they need, they need labor. A lot of these people work in construction. They need labor for the, the building. So in this setting of, setting of poverty, inequality, and breakneck urbanization, what is happening to heart disease in rural China? Well, let's take a look at what's happening in China in general. And let's compare it with the United States. Well, what happens with the uh, mortality from heart disease in the United States? And Dr. Wang, you could probably take over from this and do a much better job because you know this very well. In uh, between 1900 and about 1970, there was an increase in heart disease mortality in the United States and deaths from heart disease. And then in about 1970 or so, it leveled off and it stayed leveled off. And some of the, I mean, there are all kinds of hypotheses as to why that happened. But I think the major ones involve healthcare improvements. Healthcare in terms of caring for people who have heart disease, coronary care units, uh, defibrillators, coronary bypass surgery, okay, uh, percutaneous interventions, and very importantly, preventive cardiology. Treatment of hypertension, treatment of hyperlipidemia, uh, earlier diagnosis and treatment of diabetes. I think these are considered to be some of the factors which I'll, I'll cause this to level off and not to, to continue increasing. Some people say even if you didn't have any of this, it would have leveled off. But I really don't think so. I think our healthcare system did have an effect. I mean, with all of our defects of our healthcare system, I think it did have a positive effect in causing a leveling off of mortality in the United States from heart disease. Well, in China, in rural China in particular, this business practically doesn't exist. When I go to villages, and I, I had one man, uh, he walked three miles with chest pain. He came and he, to me with the chest pain. We had an ECG machine, we did an ECG. He had an acute myocardial infarction on his ECG. And uh, he did not, he refused to enter the hospital. Not because of money, because uh, I would have paid for that for him. He didn't trust the hospital, he didn't trust the doctors. So, his, his myocardial infarction was treated with pain medications, beta blockers, and aspirin, which I gave him at home in bed rest. So no CCU, no defibrillator, no bypass surgery, okay, no PCI, and essentially, except for my advice to him to control his blood pressure, no preventive cardiology. So let's compare the U.S. with China. This is the U.S. And this is China. Okay? If nothing is done, the number of deaths in China, of course, this is number, not percentage. Okay? So, just to understand this, couldn't be percentage. The number of deaths in China is going to continue to increase until about 2050. It's going to hit maybe 10 million deaths a year. That, once again, going back to the poor country of Haiti, there's 10 million people. It's like it's a population of a small country dying every year. That's how many people will die from heart disease and stroke in China in 2050 if nothing is done to address this problem. Why is heart disease incidence increasing in China? My thoughts, 
Number re one reason is hypertension. Number two reason is hypertension. And number three reason is hypertension. Of course there are other factors. Of course there's hyperlipidemia, there's poor diet, fatty foods, which are increasing. There's less activity, some degree of less activity. There's smoking, but that's been going on since the 50s. I think uncontrolled high blood pressure, which is increasing in severity, which is increasing in prevalence, are the, uh, is the main reason for the increased incidence and mortality from heart disease. Have there been some studies that have looked at, for example, attributable risk in the rural regions due to, say, smoking versus hypertension and some of the other risk factors? Uh, well, uh, Yan Fang Wu, his uh, cohort, which includes rural areas, the MUCA, MUCA cohort, uh, in his, hypertension is the strongest risk factor. <coughs> Triple risk from high hypertension is higher than the others, the other risks in rural areas. So just yeah. to follow up on, I remember 10, 15 years ago, WHO was predicting um, lung cancer from essentially the, the graph that you showed skyrocketing in China. Um, is smoking as prevalent in the rural areas as one would? Expect in the big cities? It's very prevalent. It it's prevalent among males, uh, about 70% of adult males, and only maybe less than 10%, 5% of uh, females. In some very remote regions, the women also smoke. They smoke pipes, but most of the women in rural China don't smoke. And is, the, is there a gender difference in the hypertension per disease? Yes, yes. It's more, more in uh, uh, higher in, in the okay. This is uh, <coughs> prevalence of hyper. This is a different study, so they're not exactly comparable, and there's all types of biases involved. But uh, if you look at the results of the different studies, starting in 1959, the earliest studies in the Chinese statistics of prevalence of hypertension in rural Chinese adults were as only about five percent. They didn't consider an important problem at all. Uh, going through uh, uh, the present, where it's as high as 35%. Uh, in our study in Yunnan, you know, it was 30% in middle-aged elderly adults. In Liaoning province in the northeast of China, it's for about 45% of adults in the rural areas have hypertension. So there's a very rapid increase in prevalence of hypertension in, uh, in countries like that. So Bob, one, one other issue about that, with, so with, with an uncontrolled hypertension, a big issue, are you seeing proportionately more strokes versus coronary disease in rural China than, for example, in urban China, where coronary disease seems to be going up and maybe stroke not quite as much because they're controlling blood pressure a little bit better in urban areas? Well, I'm not sure that's true, Nathan. I think strokes are, death from stroke, stroke mortality is still higher than, than uh, heart, uh, the coronary disease mortality everywhere in China. Stroke mortality is very high. It's one of the mysteries uh, that really, it, the difference is so great that it makes much more think there might, there might be differences in uh, genetic differences. Yeah, much more yeah. than in the states. Yeah. So stroke is a much bigger deal. Yeah. Uh, also, also in Japan, uh, stroke mortality is, is high, but Japan's a relatively small country, Korea also. But um, in China, uh, is the only large country where there's an excess of stroke mortality over heart, over, uh, heart disease mortality. But for all over city, a city and country. So. Yeah, it's not great. No, what I see, I see more strokes, yeah. I, yeah. See, I see more strokes than heart attacks. Like, you know, uh, Michael, who went with us, uh, remember we didn't see any heart attacks. Right? Mm -hmm. But we see strokes. We saw more, see more of those. Yeah. What is your definition of hypertension? Uh, yeah. It's a WHO uh, definition is either a history of hypertension or uh, a systolic blood pressure of at least 140 uh, or a diastolic of at least 90. And, and do you see, I mean, is there the prevalence of the 
degree of hypertension is it drop off with the higher levels, or do you see kind of a continuous, I mean, a, a similar <coughs> of very high blood pressure versus just breaking the definition? I think, uh, you mean compared to other places? Well, I don't know. Uh, what, what I'm to interpret the question is that we see uh, um, fewer people with very high blood pressure? Yeah, we see. Most of the people with hypertension uh, have blood pressures in uh, between 140, systolic before 140, 160, and diastolic between, say, 90 and 100, most of them. But we see also some with very high blood pressures. I mean, I, I remember seeing, seeing a lady with 260 over 140, and she'd just walk in, and I measured it three times, and it was that high. And, and she wanted to go home, and I said, no, no, you wait here. We have to give you some medicine. You know, that type of thing. So you're getting into medicine, but um, how how aggressively are you evaluating for maybe secondary causes? Is that is that a you know, secondary a, hypertension yeah, versus yeah. primary hypertension? Secondary yeah. hypertension is from a known cause, like renal artery stenosis or hyperthyroidism. You know, in China, like everywhere else, most hypertension is essential hypertension. Yeah. Uh, if if we have young women, I mean, we do a physical examination. We have young women. We've seen. Young women who uh, seem very nervous, tachycardic, fast heart rate, and would check out somebody for like that for hyperthyroidism. We've seen some of those. And in fact, some of them are so obviously hyperthyroid, I've actually treated them. Because it's not easy to get thyroid function tests. You have to send them far away. But we've actually treated them with tapazole or methanazole for hyperthyroidism and, and beta blocker. Uh, but most of them, um, I had one case of a coarctation of the aorta in an adult, which was very interesting. I didn't want to get into it now. But. Because you're doing echocardiograms. Not on everybody. Certain, certain not, not on everybody. Right? Yeah, yeah, but on some doing cases. We have echocardiography. Yeah. Um, so we're a small organization, China California Heart Watch. And uh, what are we doing uh, in China? We're, our mission is to, one, establish transnational education exchange to allow American students to study in developing areas of China, as you know, in province, research hypertension and heart disease in China, train rural health care workers, and give free clinical care. And I'm going to talk about each one of those in terms of our accomplishments. Uh, and education exchange, we have our student intern program, which uh, Michael uh, Brignani, who's here, uh, participated in. Uh, we, have, we are doing research. We have one publication in the peer-reviewed literature, in the international literature, which Ashkan Akashe is the primary author. He is a medical student at UCI. Uh, he and uh, my colleagues in China and uh, Dr. Wang here uh, wrote this paper and was published in the journal of American Journal of Hypertension in 2009. I'm going to show briefly something about that paper in the next 10 minutes. And we are teaching village doctors and uh, in training courses, which we hold now every year. And we have a uh, we have several clinical programs, but I think the most remarkable, especially for me because I never expected to do this and I am not a pediatric cardiologist, is our Grants for Kids program. Uh, last year, we helped uh, give 15, 14 children uh, a, a new chance of life who never could have undergone surgeries or procedures uh, if we hadn't been there to help them. Uh, this is Ashka Nakashe uh, in Yunnan. And uh, his paper was published in American Journal of Hypertension last year. Uh, left ventricular mass and blood pressure and untreated hypertensives in rural Yunnan. Uh, just briefly going through this in a formalistic type method. Uh, the methods that we used to do this was we um, randomly chose uh, 10 villages, uh, villages from different townships, and when we randomly chose subjects, uh, uh, residents of those villages between the ages of 50 and 70 years uh, from each village, uh, we had a total of 490 men and women. Of those 490, 344 
were available to participate. So the 490 were chosen from a list, but they, we didn't find all of them. Some of them had gone to the city to, uh, for a blue migrant labor, or some of them were too sick to come in or didn't want to come in. They did not uh, consent. Uh, so we ended up with a sample size of 344, uh, which uh, individuals to, who participated between 50 and 70 equal numbers of men and women. Uh, we took histories for uh, risk factors, smoking, alcohol use, medication use, uh, and we measured blood pressure three times, measured height and weight to get body mass index. We did cardiac ultrasound using a small portable ultrasound machine uh, at, in order to measure the interventricular septal wall thickness, that's the wall that separates the right and left ventricle, and the left, left ventricular posterior wall, that's the opposite wall of the left ventricle, and also the diameter of the ventricle, of the left ventricle and diastole. Beauty, using those three measurements, one can use a formula to calculate the mass of the left ventricle, which is a fairly accurate formula, has been used in many epidemiological studies uh, internationally. So we did, uh, in order to reduce variability, I was very nervous that we weren't going to get good measurements. In order to calculate variability and reduce variability, we did four measurements uh, of each one of these. So we had four separate left ventricular masses for each one of the 344 participants. This is me doing an ultrasound in a subject's home. We did some of these in the home, some of them in community centers, some of them in clinics. This is a small machine that we used to do the measurements on. This is a, uh, a picture. You can't see it very well, but uh, this is the interceptal, uh, the uh, septal thickness. The lights are a little bit too bright here to see this. Uh, the septal thickness in this one was 1.8 uh, centimeters, 18 millimeters. Posterior wall thickness was 16 millimeters. And the, le the internal diameter of the left ventricle was 46 millimeters. Using those three measurements, you can calculate left ventricular mass. And you use the formula called the Devereux formula, named after Professor Devereux, who's a cardiologist at Cornell University. And that's the formula. Everyone has to remember this. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Hogan is going to ask you next week, what's the devil of formula? <laughs> did you also get um, left atrial dimensions? I was curious. Yes, we did. You we did. did. We did. I didn't put it on here, but we have We haven't used that data. Yet. Yeah, that, that would be maybe well, that's the next paper. paper. Maybe someone wants to look at the left atrial dimensions and see what, how they're related to, um, to blood pressure. Uh, so we took the average of the blood pressure measurements, the average of the four estimates of left ventricular mass, and we calculated uh, the left ventricular mass index, which is left ventricular mass divided by the body surface area. This is just tells us how we did the, how we got down to 344. I'm not going to go into this. Okay. And in our results uh, of the uh, of the 344, 48% were men. Uh, body mass index was 22.6, and 38% were smokers. Most all of those were men. Uh, now, high cholesterol and diabetes. We did not measure. We did not take blood uh, specimens. We did self-reported. And in rural areas, uh, people never get tested. So you basically, we asked them, do you have high cholesterol? And they would say yes or no. No, in many cases, think they really don't know. So these data are a little bit questionable, quite frankly. There's a problem with them. Uh, it would have been nicer to do finger sticks or some kind of measurement, but we didn't have that available when we started the study. Uh, blood pressure, mean blood pressure was 130, diastolic blood pressure mean was 75. And 
mean left ventricular mass was 138 grams. And this is the relationship between systolic blood pressure and left ventricular mass. Uh, as the blood pressure increases, the left ventricular mass increases. This is a significant relationship with an R squared of 0.22 and a, a slope of 0.4 for the systolic blood pressure. So remember, slope is 0.4, whereas for the diastolic blood pressure, slope is 0.7. There was a stronger relationship with uh, diastolic blood pressure. So left ventricular mass, the size of the left ventricle, had a stronger relationship with diastolic than with systolic blood pressure, which is kind of an interesting finding because it's not what we found in studies in the United States like the cardiac study, right, Nathan? Yeah, but I thought the electric R was higher for systolic. Let yeah, the R is higher, but the slope, the slope is, yeah, R is 0.2. Oh, okay. R squared is 0.2, oh, oh, yeah. and the R squared is 0.18. So there's a little higher. But the slope here for the uh, diastolic is 0.7. It's almost twice. So the relationship is a stronger, steeper relationship. How much time do you spend with, with each subject? Uh, to do okay. this, 30 minutes to do the historical information, measure the blood pressure, and do the, uh, do the ultrasound. And we do it in teams, we, we rotate. So we'll have three teams, one team, actually sometimes four teams. Uh, we'll have one uh, team doing uh, intake and history and registration, consent. One team is doing blood pressure. Then we have usually the, <laughs> the medical student that doesn't speak Chinese and they measures height and weight. <laughs> and then uh, I and one other student will be doing the ultrasounds. And you've been able to get the electric undergraduate student interns yes, involved in this? Yes, so yes, yes. We train them. Uh, we, train, we train the students on the first two days when they arrive in, in, in Yunnan. We train them to measure blood pressure. And uh, also we certify them, test them, make sure they're doing it accurately. We do that, yes. OK, uh, so this is just another way of looking at these data. The relationship between blood pressure uh, category, normal, mild, moderate, severe hypertension, systolic and diastolic, there are these relationships with left ventricular mass, there's a constant increase in mass as you increase your category, the severe hypertension being much higher than the normal, particularly when you look at diastolic. The mass is the highest. In severe diastolic hypertension you have the highest left ventricular mass. It would be very interesting someday to plot the um, systolic versus diastolic on separate axes to see if there's any sort of J-shaped thing going on like with the diastolic. Yes. Okay. Um, and when we did multivariable analysis adjusting for age and body mass index and gender, we also found the uh, relationships, uh, significant relationships between left ventricular mass and blood pressure uh, with a stronger relationship, coefficient 0.7 as opposed to 0.38. For diastolic, 0.7. For systolic, 0.38. These are the beta coefficients in the multivariable analysis. Do most of you know how this works, multivariable analysis. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, okay, when you adjust for covariates, you still see a strong relationship with diastolic. Okay. So we concluded in our paper that the high prevalence of untreated hypertension in Europe, there was a high prevalence in rural Yunnan of 30%. 30% of our subjects had hypertension. There was a strong relationship between blood pressure and left ventricular mass. And uh, the untreated diastolic blood pressure may have a greater effect on left ventricular mass because all of the subjects that we uh, studied were untreated. If they were taking treatment for, for hypertension, that was an inclusion criteria. Because there, most people don't are not treated. Now, when we finished the study, some of you points, you guys say, you mean you didn't treat them? Of course we treated them. We did the survey, and then immediately we put them on medication if they had high blood pressure and also gave them appropriate advice uh, 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 
life, uh, the lifestyle modification in Pakistan. Uh, but all of the participants, when we saw them, were not receiving treatment for the blood. All the participants with high blood pressure, none of them were receiving treatment. So we believe that untreated diastolic blood pressure may have a, a higher, a greater effect. Yes. And the reason they weren't receiving it was because they hadn't seen anybody, or that they had. They didn't know. They, most of them didn't know they had. To. Because they had no contact right. with healthcare, or because right. the healthcare. Right. Right. No one measured their blood pressure. They didn't know. <clears throat> and some of them had been taking medication, and they just stopped because they didn't know they had to continue to take it. There's also an unfortunate tendency um, of some physicians. See, physicians in China are fee-for-service providers. They're not paid by the state. And even those doctors are fee-for-service providers. So there's a temptation. Uh, oh, and another factor, was they, they get a percentage on medications. When they prescribe medications, they, make, they get a cut on that. So there's a tendency to give expensive medications because they get more money. So uh, they rather than give hydrochlorothiazide, which is very cheap, uh, they will give uh, an ARB, which is expensive, but once they give one prescription for two weeks, then the farmer can't buy it anymore. So it's finished. It doesn't, it doesn't take medication past two weeks, yes. When you say you gave recommendations about uh, lifestyle changes, yes, yes, what do you mean by yes. that? Mostly uh, reducing salt intake. Mostly reducing salt intake, but uh, also uh, uh, smoking cessation. Uh, al reducing alcohol intake and also drink. There's many of the men also drink. Drinking is primarily also a male vice. Yes. Did you find much? Um, uh, I'm thinking the, the training the physicians there. There's kind of like a, a negative consequence for them if they do what would be better. I'm going to talk about training physicians, but let me choose just a couple minutes because we that's our, our second program we're going to talk about. Well, let me just, the third program. The student internship program, uh, these, is our, these were uh, one of our groups of student interns. Some of these, uh, Daisy Shin is a UCI student. Ben Zachariah, some of you may know, he's a UCI student. This was one group of uh, student interns uh, last year. They went with us. Uh, uh, Carol Thompson is a nurse uh, from Hulk Hospital. She volunteered to help us. And uh, Dr. Poon, Kimball Poon, is a cardiologist from Los Angeles who uh, volunteered. And this is uh, County uh, Director Tsai, wonderful lady, very dedicated to her, uh, her, uh, her citizens. Uh, she is the director of Yangby County in, uh, near Dali City. And, uh, and this is uh, Mr. Lee, her assistant. Uh, this is Dr. Poon examining uh, a little girl. And this is one of our students, uh, Lena Kong, uh, who is a Columbia student examining a child. Uh, this is uh, Anastasia Kolosova. Uh, she's the She's Russian, but she lives in England, and she's the girl, uh, uh, the young girl who uh, recently wrote to me because she is working on this project for her university, looking at distance from the village, distance from the city, and prevalence of hypertension. <coughs> and this is another one of our students, Tyler Byes in Arizona. Uh, when, we, when we leave a township at the end of the internship, I have our students write a report in English and then translated into Chinese. And this is the report uh, from one of our villages, which we give to the local health department. And we tell them how many people have high blood pressure, how many have severe high blood pressure, how many are treated, how many are not treated, what treatment they're receiving, and what we recommend be done. Our hypertension training seminar is getting back to Dr. Chun's question. We started these in 2008. The first training seminar was in Kunming. Uh, Professor Wong was on the faculty. This is another faculty member, uh, Joy Beckman, who was a uh, cardiac uh, nurse at uh, Harvard UCLA Medical Center. Joy is a, a, a Chinese-born American, or American, American-born, no. Chinese-born, I guess, CBA. <laughs> she was born in China, but now she lives in America. <laughs> 
and she's training uh, village doctors here to measure each other's blood pressure. This lady in the fancy costume is a honey, honey, it's a honey uh, minority. And this was our training seminar in Quibbing in 2008. In April 2008, we trained 160 village doctors. In 2009, we had two, two trainings, uh, uh, two trainings, one in Zhongtian in northeast, northwestern Yunnan, we trained 40 village doctors, and one in Longling in southwestern, we trained 130 village doctors. And in 2010, April, we're going to have three in April, uh, and we, we hope to uh, reach at least 300 village doctors, and we tend to, re we want to repeat that in October. So we have two uh, sessions, three, two times, two different times, uh, three training seminars each time. The one in 2010 will be in Pua, which is another state, another prefecture in Yunnan. Uh, we invite renowned international and national lecturers. Does anyone recognize this? If you're Chinese, you might recognize him. He is Hu Dai He is the most famous cardiologist in China. He lectured at the first Kunming seminar. And he's attending our internship mission in, in, in April. He's going to race. And we also have local faculty uh, who train uh, from Kunming who train our uh, village doctors. Uh, some of these local faculty are doctors at Kunming Medical College. Some of them are missionary doctors. Uh, this is Dr. Lu Chang, who uh, is a, uh, he's a professor at Singapore University, but he is a missionary doctor now working with a Christian group, and he's an excellent teacher. He's used to, he trains village doctors as his work there. And he helps us train uh, those doctors using the very innovative methods of training, very simple methods that they can understand. How to diagnose and treat hypertension. Uh, this is practical training, how to measure blood pressure. Taking an exam, we give them exams. Uh, we give the exams before the session and after the session to see what improvement we can see. And then we award certificates, and I'm getting out the formers there. And this is our graduating class. Now, you have questions? This is a good time. About the oh, just the conflicts with the financial conflicts, training the village doctors versus doing what's best for their patients. Well, you know, you have to understand, the village doctors are farmers, and they're not rich. They are poor. They may be a little, a little bit better off than the other farmers, but not much. Okay. So we have to understand their financial needs. Sure. And what we're trying to train them to do is, most important thing is, hypertension is a long-term disease. You have to treat it for a long time. So that means when you find a patient with hypertension, that patient is your patient for life. Every time they come back for a, 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 a visit, you make money. Every time you prescribe a medicine, you're going to make money. But if you prescribe a medicine which is so expensive that they can't take the medicine, they're not going to come back. So we try to say that this is the right way for your villagers, for your patients, and it's that also can work out well for you. It, you know, we, we do a little calculation to show them that it can. And we think it has some effect. We're hoping it has some effect. Now, there are healthcare reforms on the table in China. I don't have the data on that now, which are kind of going to discourage uh, prescribing expensive medications for problems like hypertension. There are reforms which the Chinese government is now beginning to, to enact. So um, basically, given your focus on generics, which I think have a very important role in hypertension mm -hmm. treatment, have some of the manufacturers of the generic drugs been interested in perhaps partnering? I would love to do that. That makes a lot of sense. To have a manufacturer uh, who wants to, um, well, for example, uh, ARBs, they're going generic in China uh, next year, or this year. Losartan first? Or? Yeah, Losartan. Yeah. So uh, we'd like to get, maybe a local co uh, company wants to get it on the EDL, on the essential drug list in China. That'd be a big great for them. It would make sense for them perhaps, to help us. But 
you know, I only have so much time in my day, I can't do anything. Yeah, like, you know, so you, know, you have to do that application. <laughs> <laughs> or, or I'm actually J.C. Aaron, who has, who, yeah. who is, is very involved <laughs> with the actually generic drug market in yeah. China, right? He's on our board. Thank you. Um, I yeah. have a question regarding medicine. Yeah. So most of the medicine in is it Western medicine or is it like medicine made in China? Do they come in vaccines? Okay, well, first of all, there's Western medicine and then there's Chinese medicine, the traditional Chinese medicine. We don't prescribe traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, I, um, there are, I mean, I read you on, like this could be a, another talk. There are, some of them have some degree of effectiveness, but practically the way they're used in the country, traditional Chinese medicines, they're not effective at all. And everyone, almost everyone I see who's on traditional Chinese medicine and blood pressure is sky high. Although I know there are some of them, particularly uh, uh, Danchan, Danchan has been shown to be effective. But uh, we, I don't prescribe them. So that's, now the medicines, the Western medicines are manufactured in China. We don't, there may be international, multinational corporations like Sheridan Plow and Pfizer, but they're manufactured in China. Are they, um, do they have a large supply of them? How do yes. the villagers yes. access? Yes, they're all on this essential drug list. They're all, there are large supplies, uh, and they all, they are available to the, uh, to the local doctors and to the farmers, in, in local pharmacies, yes. So Chloe, you're saying isn't, isn't the issue, right? It's mainly trying to get the people right. screened and Make, uh, educating, educating their educate. doctors. Yes. I'm curious about the term village doctor and what kind of formal education they have. They have three months, very good question. Uh, they have three months of, 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 medic, of, of treatment. Uh, training. <laughs> three months of training after high school. So they all have to be literate in Mandarin, theoretically, although I've met quite a few who are really not literate in Mandarin, surprising, but there are some. Uh, yeah, but they're supposed to be literate in Mandarin, they're supposed to have graduated from high school, and then they have three months of training after that. Some of them have a little more training, maybe six or nine months of training. And in, during that training, they receive little or no tra uh, training about chronic diseases like, like uh, hypertension. Yes? With the people going on to the provinces and you train them, what, what kind of follow-up do you have after you've trained them? Because you're just saying that, that you, you did mention this is a long-term treatment. Okay, so that's another project. That maybe you can volunteer and, and step uh, in. We, we, you know, I, I, what I had been wanting to do, I almost did it last year, but we just had too many things to do, is we would do the training seminar, and we would, uh, before the training seminar, I would go into, say, three or four villages where I knew there was a good chance that that doctor was going to come to the training seminar. I would go in and measure 30 blood pressures in that village. And then a few months after the seminar, we'd go back to the same village and measure 30 blood pressures and see if the blood pressure went down or not. But we just haven't, other than, other than the pre and post exams, which are not very good follow-up, we have not done that type of even medium-term follow-up. But it's certainly an excellent idea. We really kind of need a grant for that. You know? Or if there's a way to even survey the doctors who participated in these training courses, like one year later, you know, yeah. asking them what they're doing, you know. Um, well, they'll all tell you they're doing good things. But, you know, so. <laughs> I mean, what are they going to tell you? No, I, I didn't pay any attention to you. I don't know what you're saying. They're going to tell us they're doing good things. The best way is to go in and see how the blood pressure is changing. Yeah. I'll yeah. good. 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 get us internet access and see. Mm, non-existent in many places. Uh, I mean, in, in some town centers, in town centers, usually there's one computer in the administrative office, or two maybe. In very large towns, there may be an uh, internet bar. But there's, in the villages, there's no computer access. Village doctors don't have computer access. So do you think over the next 10 years, you might be able to train these positions uh, via the internet? No. no. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say in 10 years. Uh, internet is spreading in there, but not not rapidly. Not rapidly. I certainly couldn't do it now. Uh, let me talk about our last program here, our clinical care program. Uh, and just just I'm just going to talk about the, the children because we do also do clinical care for adults. 
Yunnan province has about 50,000 children with congenital heart disease, and that's based on one study done by a professor at, at uh, uh, Kunming Medical College. She's a surgeon, and she, she did a prevalence survey in a large part of the province. And just extrapolating from her prevalence survey, that's about how many kids have um, congenital heart disease in the Yunnan province. It's a lot of children, 50,000. Each year, uh, the local hospitals, I think there are four or five in Kunming, and one or two in Dali, uh, do about 2,000 procedures, either surgical or non-surgical procedures, to correct congenital heart defects. So you can see that the numbers don't match up. You take a long time, at 2,000 a year, to reach 50,000, and the kids keep being born. So, Obviously, what's happening to the others? In the United States, uh, we don't see older children or adults with uncorrected congenital heart disease. We see them rarely uh, because they're usually almost all corrected when they're small or they die if they can't be corrected. So they either don't survive or they are corrected. But in China, they don't get corrected and they live into adulthood, miserable lives, suffering all their lives, or they die at an early age. And the parents can do nothing, and the problem is knowledge, one, and two, money. The local uh, medical community doesn't have the knowledge to do the screening and diagnosis, and even if they can screen and diagnose, there's nothing they can do about it, because the families don't have the money. Can so we started uh, a, a program for children in 2008. And in 2008, we supported successful surgical or percutaneous intervention treatments of five children. That was our beginning. And our goal at the beginning of 2009 was to double that number to 10. Uh, that was our stated goal. And we stated it at our fundraiser not too far from here, uh, Irvine um, Valley College. We we're going to try to do 10. In 2009, with the help of, generous help of uh, equipment donations from AGA Corporation, which makes medical devices to fix the children's hearts, and Sonocyte Corporation, which makes ultrasound, and collaborations with Chinese foundations like the Red Cross Foundation and the Washaw Foundation, we didn't do 10, we did 14 children. And this is one of the things, we had zero mortality in 2009 uh, and zero serious morbidity. All the kids went home and were followed up six months later and they're all doing well. And I want to show you a picture of each one of these kids. Two years, I'm going to be there. So many kids, I'm going to have to click this for an hour. <laughs> so, still, we have thousands of kids that need help. This is the fundraising part of the talk, but you know, I'm not expecting you to give me a lot of money. Just to show you why, why do we ask the two thousand dollars from the students' family? John, we we plan to expand this, uh, and this year we hope to do twenty-five to thirty kids. Uh, we hope to help. We've already done three. One is a little girl with cleft lip, cleft palate, who had severe heart disease. She had patent ductus arteriosus, and ventricular septal defect, and atrial septal defect, three defects. We've corrected all three defects. We have an effective medication to treat her pulmonary artery, high blood pressure, hypertension. It's another type of hypertension. She's now uh, getting discharged from uh, the hospital in Chengdu, where this, the procedures were done. She's going home in a couple of days back to Kunming. And she has cleft lip, cleft palate, six months. We're going to refer her to an oral surgeon who will also do uh, charitable, charitably funded surgery to give her a beautiful smile. And all the boys will love her. Uh, we have two other little children who, uh, while I'm last month in January, 
uh, underwent procedures at uh, Kunming's St. John's uh, Cardiology Hospital, St. John's Heart Disease Hospital. It's, a, it's nothing to do with uh, religion. It's the name of the hospital, St. John's Heart Disease Hospital in Kunming. Is that Two where you're doing most of the surgeries now in Kunming? We're, that's where we do the percutaneous procedures. The surgeries we do either at Yan'an Hospital in Kunming, at the Chengdu Military Hospital, uh, oh, yeah. because we know the doctors there, in one of those two hospitals. Yeah. Are these Chinese doctors that are doing the yes. procedures? Yes. 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 Through the all Chinese doctors. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. This is should be on here. That's all. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, to do a percutaneous uh, procedure, simple, simple, like a ventricular septal defect closure, uh, $20,000 RMB, $3,000. Between, between $15,000 and $20,000, so it's about $2,000 to $3,000. Uh, to do surgery like in the little girl in Chengdu, that's much more expensive. Um, now what we've done is we've kind of multiplied our ability to help these kids because now we have support from other foundations. Like the little girl in Chengdu, China California Hardware, she didn't have to pay for her. We had the Hua Sha Foundation, which is a large foundation in Beijing. The way they work is they match a child with a donor. So they have a child that needs help and they go out and hunt for a donor, a wealthy person in China. And they found a donor for this little girl, so they paid for the surgery. But we we work with them. And some of those groups are matching donations that 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 I'm actually trying to cow will make because Yeah, another you know, organization is called the Children's Hope. Children's Hope uh, Foundation. They're a Christian based foundation. They're they used to be uh, based in the US but now they're totally in China. And what they do is every time we find a child that needs uh, help, they uh, they they give us, I think, 7,000 RMB. 7,000, that's a good part of the, it can be almost half. They give 7,000 to support that kid's surgery. And then you support the balance. Yeah, I support, so we support the balance. Yeah. 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 Yes? Um, when you're choosing which kids with the congenital heart defects get, get the treatment, how do we choose them? Yeah. We have, okay. we have, a, we have, a, we do two types of screen. One is medical. Uh, I will, I have to approve them. Otherwise, I'm, I approve whether or not we're going to support. Okay. We may recommend it, but I will approve whether they're going to support. And then two, one is a medical uh, screening. I, I, I have to feel that if there is a good chance that this child's heart can be fixed, and that there, there's not a high mortality. Uh, I told you about the child who went to Beijing, had surgery, and came back and died two weeks later. I don't want that ever to happen again. I mean, it probably will eventually, but I want to reduce the possibility of that happening. Because that is, it would have been, it's better just not, not to try than to have that happen. So that's one. The second one is an economic one. Uh, the the uh, family has to show us proof of poverty. They have, there are documents they have to produce. So, uh, Pinkun Zhongming and Shou Zhongming. These are a proof of income and proof of poverty, which uh, they 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 can uh, they have to produce. Now, of course, families may cheat. I mean, they may get a friend, like you know, to sign off on these documents. But we can't do anything about that. We don't go beyond asking them for those documents. Yes. Um. I did some pre pre preliminary study, and a lot of minority um, people in China are illiterate. So yeah. when you ask them to produce documents like that, do you have assistance? For That's them? a very good question. Uh, many are illiterate, so well, how can they produce documents? The local governments are always involved. So we, we don't, we never, uh, we never, the local government's always involved. So, the local, we communicate with the local government, the local government knows this, and they help with that, if the families are over yeah. Yes. 
How many have you turned down in the last year? Obviously, I'm going to guess that you had several applicants for yeah. this type of work. Can you give us some? Answers? About five. Okay. So you know. Um, three of them, for medical reasons, they were just too complicated. I just didn't want to take a chance. And, and two of them, because they didn't have, uh, they, they admitted, you know, their incomes were high. And they were in a range where I, I thought it would be, they probably could raise the money. So I referred them to a local place. How closely do you follow the, through their procedures? And what kind of commitment is there afterwards? How closely do you follow the procedures? I mean, after the procedure is done? Well, before, during, and after, as far as like, do you determine which hospital they go to, which doctor do they see yeah. for their treatment? And then afterwards, how long is the commitment of the organization? Well, I, I have to approve, in order to approve the grant, I have to know which hospital they're going to. If I don't like the hospital, I think it's not a good hospital, I won't approve the grant. Okay. And they can go to any hospital they want, but then they're going to have to find their own money. Yeah. So um, uh, that's uh, number one. In terms of follow-up afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, the hospitals have been doing that. And they do that with six-month follow-up visits. Now, there are some of them that don't do the six-month follow-up visits. And that's troublesome for me because I don't know what happens when they go back to the village. Mm -hmm. We have had no reports of problems, but there could be problems that we don't know about. Uh, and once again, that's because we're small yeah. and we just don't have the funding. Now, I recently hired a nurse, uh, and I'm hoping that she uh, she's a, a, young, a young woman, she's 26 years old, and I'm hoping she will, we can get her to go to some of these places and do follow-up. Like places. the cost of follow-up care, if there's a complication or something like that, is yeah. it? Is, is there a commitment for that to the families? We don't have any, we don't make a commitment, but if we have, uh, if there's a problem, we've always covered it. Mm -hmm. We had one child, didn't have surgery, but was on medication and did poorly, and we had to take, we, we covered the, the cost of that child being admitted to an intensive care unit and treated when they went home. Yeah. Yes. I, I know you didn't mean to show this slide, but uh, it's, it's... No, we haven't started on the talk. Yeah. <laughs> I think two years ago, the, uh, in the U.S., the Institute of Medicine recommended that the Food and Drug Administration start regulating salt um, yeah. in, in American diet. And FDA said, we have too many problems, so we won't follow up on this. And I, I, I just... What is the equivalent? Do you have support for the educational component of prevention, to, to talk to people about salt intake, and, uh, and is there support from the Chinese government agencies that... We have no support from the Chinese government to do that. We do, we do advise people about reducing salt intake, but as you uh, probably know, uh, advice about dietary changes, you know, it goes in one ear and out the other ear, and I don't think they... And we, we tell everybody who's smoking to stop smoking. And when I do that, I sit in the room and I tell them, you have to stop smoking. Because you have high blood pressure because you smoke. And everybody, all the guys in the room laugh. It's a joke. They're addicted. They know they can't stop smoking. It's a joke. That's the salt data. China, this is from the industry. This is the uh, salt uh, production in China. It's surpassed the United States. Yes? Under what kind of uh, conditions do you work with? Like, uh, do you have an infrastructure in place in Yunnan? Do you have toilets, running water? Is that what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, uh, I personally own an apartment, which I lease for zero money to the China California Heart Watch to use. Uh, as a clinic, we have a living room set up as a clinic. We uh, have the sleeping area set up as residence for the students. When the students come, like if you come to do an, an internship, you, you're, you're a practicum, you stay there. Um, and uh, we also use it as office space. Uh, we have rented a, uh, a similar uh, uh, residence or uh, facility in Valley City. 
So we're opening up a satellite clinic in Dali City. I want to hire a, a doctor to run the satellite. So we have that. What else? That's it. We have an ultrasound machine, two of them. We have ECG machine. We have other simple medical equipment. That's it. That's all we have. Last question here. Yes. What is the estimated cash outlay of a volunteer going into this program? Uh, how much would it cost you to volunteer? Yeah. Just uh, flight, food. Well, yeah, sustenance, airfare. Yeah. You know, I would well, volunteer. What's going to cost if you? If you're, if you're, if you are willing to stay at our residence in Kunming, it's free. We offer that to volunteers so it's because it's large. There's plenty of places to sleep. If you don't want to stay at the residence, you have to pay for your own apartment. And that will be, um, oh, uh, a few hundred dollars a month, maybe three hundred dollars a month. Uh, and food, uh, maybe also maybe $150, $200 a month for food. Um, and they and cover the own airfare as well, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, airfare is the Oh, airfare. No, we don't cover airfare. Yeah, yeah. And this is a proper one. The only, uh, are you a physician? No, I'm not, but yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think of it in terms of Because if you're, if you're a physician and we really want to get there to help us, then we pay their airfare. Okay. We've done that for a couple of people. No, I'm not, not that we don't want you. <laughs> it's a long journey. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a donation and the airfare um, that that essentially everyone has to, has to pay. Well, it's a different thing. Yeah. Okay, student interns yeah. or doing practicum, they have to pay their own expenses and they also, we request the donations, which is on the website. Volunteers with medical experience, okay, doctors and nurses, we, we don't pay your airfare, you don't have to give a donation, you know, just as long as you're acceptable and we need, we'll take that. If you're a pediatric cardiologist, if you have these special skills, or, or often adult cardiologists, we'll also pay the airfare, up to $1,200. Basically what I'm inquiring about is, since you're a 501-3C, these folks can write this off their taxes. Yes, right? yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. I'm looking at the internships on the website. I noticed the donations kind of vary whether you do the- it Depends on the length of the internship. Yeah, so if it was- The two-week internship is 1,400, the three-week is 2,000, the five week is twenty five hundred. Okay. But the five week is is filled up. We don't have any more places in June and July. Okay. We have places in May, in August, September, and October. June and July is still. Okay. So for those of us that say may want to do this as a practicum site, I'm, I'm in a master's program. We have to uh -huh. decide for practicum. Yes. Um, is it possible to change the duration of our? Yes. 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 I already talked to. You. Okay. Professor, and then, yes. And then what I the, just talk to me about it. We'll arrange something. If you're in a practice, we'll arrange something. We'll arrange a reasonable the right. donation, make it reasonable. Okay. Thank you so much.